Reverend Carla. Welcome to Spirituality Matters. And now I invite you to settle in to find that sacred space between here where I am and there where you are. And let us be reminded that the Holy transcends our physical bodies and our time together is just as meaningful and sacred as if we were sitting beside one another. Now let's get started. I am so honored to once again welcome Reverend Arda Ides to our show today because uh, for those of you who joined us last week for our, our amazing God is Gay Masterclass, this was our first day view class together. And Arda, I know you feel as I do, it was a it was a success. Yeah, absolutely. I um I'm very pleased with the way it turned out. And I'm pleased with the response, especially that we got from the attendees. So it was a pleasure to do it. And I, I can't wait to do it again. Yeah, same. And it's it's just an honor to be with you in that. Um, I, we've heard several times how the information that we brought people had never heard before. And I, for those of you who are listening today, just know that uh, be looking out. There's going to be all kinds of uh, master classes and workshops coming up. Now, the day we have a gift for you because we had so many uh, questions left over from our God is Gay Masterclass, Reverend Arda and I decided to get together today and answer the remaining few questions with the time that we have. So that's what we're going to do. So we're just going to dive right in and get started. So um, the first question I'm going to I'm going to answer, and it. Um, they ask someone from the class asked, "Are there scriptures that support feminism?" And Reverend Arda, just because I'm answering this, if there's anything you want to add to any of this, please do. No, so. please, because, by all means, by all means. Okay, well, this was an interesting to interesting one for me because for the longest time, when I the way I was raised, of course, Jesus was was considered a traditionalist. Um, because what everything about Christianity was really filtered, uh, focused more on Paul's teachings. And a lot of times, now that you, you start to see Jesus through a new set of eyes, once you've deconstructed from some of, your, some of the evangelical beliefs of my childhood, you actually realize that Jesus could be said to be a feminist. Now, in my research for, to answer this question, I actually found a book. Now, I cannot endorse this book, but I'm certainly going to order it for myself. It's called Jesus Feminist, An Invitation to Revisit the Bible's View. And this is by Sarah Bessie, B-E-S-S-E-Y. This is not on our resource recommendations yet on, at numasoul.com because I'm going to read it, but it's at least... I'm not afraid to recommend something to you for you to figure out for yourself. That's the whole point of what Reverend Arda and I are doing here is encouraging you to explore your spirituality from your truth, from where you are, from your experiences. So this is something for you to do. But what I immediately when this question came up for me, the first thing I thought of was, of course, Jesus was a feminist. We don't need a better example, knowing, of course, that he he was a Jew. We know that he he honored the traditions. He he prayed in the temples. We know all that, but we also know that he empowered women. And the first one that we think of is Mary Magdalene. Now, there are many scholars who think that perhaps he. Uh, was even married to her. I'm not going to go down that path, but we know that she was empowered and she was highly influential. We know she was um, uh, rich off for her time and she traveled with him. And even though she has been dismissed as part of the uh, disciples, many of us, I for one believe that she was. She was, a, she was a person with influence with Jesus. Now counter that with some of the teachings of Paul, where you see Paul relegates the women to a, a lesser standard where women were almost, um, I don't know, like uh, a commodity, you know, like we were, we were definitely something that was a little bit above cattle, I believe. <laughs> we could have, we could be auctioned off and sold off and he certainly wrote quite a bit that's been used in, in, in my religious heritage that, that told us to be silent during in places of leadership or it were places where we could be influential. And honestly, now that women have, are starting to find their voices, I'm like, well, Paul, bless your heart. You know, you were just as intimidated as some of the men that you see now. But some of the most, I think the most powerful men are the ones who understand that women are 
a helpmate doesn't necessarily mean that we can just, what, how many babies we can pop out. It's more about using our minds and bringing our character and how much we have to offer society. So now getting back to the question, because I know I'm getting distracted here, but the, you, the Bible itself is written from a place of patriarchal traditions. So I'm going to have to, I really have to stretch out there really far to say that you're going to find verses that support feminism. Other than you can find things that will tell you that human beings are sacred. You can see those verses, you can find those verses, but then you can also see where women over time were a, a used and abused. So it's like there's a contradiction in all of these things. I would encourage you to pick up a book like Jesus Feminist. If you could just go to Amazon and you just search that, you'll find five or six. And then just pay attention to the, to the teachings of Jesus. And there you will find at least a platform of compassion that extended beyond the traditional norms of the patriarchal system at that time. I'm not going to put words in Jesus' mouth any more than anybody else can. So that's the answer to that question that I have. So Reverend Arda, I'm going to give you a question now and let you answer this one. How can we help cis hetero individuals adopt queerness into their own life without them feeling like their sexuality is threatened or we're trying to force queerness on them? That's a, <laughs> That's a good question. That's a, it's a, but it's a good question. I think it's probably phrased that way because of the way I ended the workshop saying that we as a society need to be more queer because being, you know, being so heterosexual is killing us. You know, our, our heterosexual ideology is killing us. Um, how do we get society to become more queer? Well, and, and let me clarify that when we say become more queer, again, I'm not saying that society needs to become more, uh, we literally don't be, have to become gay, lesbian, transgender. That's not what I was saying. That's not what I meant. What I mean is developing that sense of compassion, that sense of humanity that you find among the queer community. Being queer is, being queer, it's unconditional love. It's radical acceptance, right? It is, it's making space for everybody, especially those who don't necessarily fit in with cultural or societal norms. So, the best thing we can do is lead by example, you know? And it's really not about, um, it's not going to affect their heterosexuality because we're not pushing it. And I'm saying we, as if I'm a member of the queer community, but I'm technically I'm not, but uh, I'm saying, we're not necessarily, that's not what we're pushing on them. We're not pushing on them um, that they should be part that, of the queer community, but just to that that radical acceptance, which shouldn't even be called radical. You know, there shouldn't be such a thing as radical acceptance, but that unconditional love, that sense of being in community, um, to stop otherizing people. That's you perfect. know, that's really what it's about. Yeah. And the best way to do that really is by leading through example. And I think doing the kind of things that we're doing right here, right now, you know, is having those conversations. Um, I don't think that, you know, I don't think your average person who's cis hetero that really doesn't have anybody from the queer community around them understands what it means to be queer. They don't understand what it is to be embraced by the queer community. They don't, you know, so all of it is very foreign to them. Powerful things happen and I, you've seen this too, Reverend Carla, you witnessed this yourself. Radical kindness, radical compassion can completely shift a human being. You know, it can completely, and a lot of these people have not ever experienced that kind of radical acceptance. They don't know any differently. You know, so that's always my first 
my go-to is my first, my go-to was always uh, teaching by example. That's perfect. The other rising is, is, is so perfect. And, and also talking about just, you know, that, that compassion, people think they're being compassion, compassionate, but they don't realize how many conditions they're putting around it. So that's, that's beautiful. Beautiful, beautifully said. Rebar. Let me add this. I'm always amazed by the number of people that are truly unaware of the kind of harm that they're doing to mm -hmm. certain communities. Um, it, I'm fascinated by the number of religious people that don't realize the harm and the damage and the trauma they're causing to the queer community. They, a lot of them sincerely have no idea. It's not an excuse, I'm not excusing it, you know, but a lot of them genuinely don't know. And when they realize it, they're horrified. I had someone once, when I once explained how traumatizing the kind of trauma that's endured by the queer community, just by even little things, right? A person said to me, oh my God, I don't ever want to harm anybody that way. I had no idea. I had no idea. People don't know. So it's all about education. That, that's, that's perfect as well. I know there are people who, uh, even when you tell them that it's harming them, they still reject that. They, they reject that notion. And that might be a good segue into um, the next question. I'm going to answer it, but please feel free to chime in. It says, how do you respond to family members that say God doesn't hate the sinner, he hates the sin? Or I don't agree with your way of life, but we love and accept you anyway. So that is exactly the kind of phrase. Um, and I actually wrote a blog about this that you might remember. Um, it was back in um, set September when I wrote about the hate the sin, um, love the sinner kind of phrase that's, that's thrown out so often and how much damaging, how much damage that does to a person. Um, they think that phrase came from St. Augustine in the fourth century. He, uh, he was a fourth century philosopher. And what he said, he was writing to a group of nuns. And what he said was he, he encouraged the nuns to have love for mankind and hatred of sins. And when I read that, uh, that hits me differently than saying hate the sin, love the sinner. When you hear love for mankind, but hatred of sins, that to me says something about setting themselves apart to be able to serve without judgment. That's, that's kind of the way I read this, but maybe it's also because I've heard the hate the sin, love the sinner uh, mantra for so long that I already know what it means. So I don't know if I can be, have a biased opinion of, obviously I don't know what this person from fourth, fourth century was writing about. But it also has been attributed, if you look on Pinterest, sometimes you'll actually find places where that saying, hate the sin, love the sinner, has been attributed to Gandhi. But what Gandhi actually was saying in his autobiography, he said, hate the sin, love the sinner is rarely practiced. Because what he was saying, he said, if we had less, if you were truly living that, you would have less hate in the world. By the way, if you've never read his 1929 autobiography, I finished it this winter and it is fabulous. Um, he said, let me, let me start over again. He said, um, there would be less hate in the world. However, because it leads to disdain for humans, it is understandable why Jesus didn't ask us to love fellow sinners, but to love our neighbors. So, okay, wait a minute. <laughs> All of a sudden, that phrase takes on an entirely different meaning and Gandhi was rejecting it fully. And the book actually talks a lot about his experiences with Christians, um, where he was actually proselytized to several times and people thought that he was actually converting to Christianity. And when he didn't, they uninvited him to their homes. He wasn't allowed to come in. Can you imagine? not disinviting Gandhi to your home. I, I, I find that absolutely amazing. But what that, this, this phrase is a perfect example of weaponizing sin, of weaponizing something that doesn't even, the scripture, there's no foundation for scripture for this phrase whatsoever. 
but you will find this used, oh my gosh, how many times a week in our comment sections and in our DMs? You see it, I see it, because it's one of those things that um, the Christian has been indoctrinated to say, and they have no idea how, how much damage it's causing. What it also does is puts them in a place of power where they think they have the right to tell me, quote, what my sins are. I have a lot of problems with that word anyway because of how it's been used to control my life in the past about someone else deciding what my sins were and what I needed to work on and how I was almost robotic in my response. Like, oh, okay, pastor so-and-so says I need to do this. So I, that's because that's my sin, my sin of offense or my sin of questioning, my sin of doubt, whatever it was. I would then try to, you know, go into some kind of um, conditioned response to try to push that away. So, but what this does is empower the Christian to have some kind of authority. They really believe that they have this authority to say this to someone as if they have the right to will judgment on the entirety of the world. And what you're seeing is a massive pushback on people saying, you know what, I reject that. It's also a distraction for the things that they should be working on themselves. So the question it's, it is, once again, how do you respond? I, I've done a couple of videos on that, and I know you've, you've written about it a couple of times in comments, but basically the best place to start is to tell them that it's a very passive aggressive, toxic response to someone else's life where you don't have the right to judge me in that way. That's that that to me is the easiest way to do it doesn't mean that it's going to stop there because more than likely it, they're going to be astounded that you are pushing back on that because it's so much a part of how their faith shows up that they that they don't even they doesn't even come up in their mind that they don't have the right to say it but if you can start to empower yourself to, to reject anyone's judgment of you, no matter how much they think they're loving you, some of the most toxic words that Christian can, can, Christians can say have love in the phrase, and they don't know it. So reject it fully and tell them that they have no right to judge you. That's what I have to say about that. <laughs> um, I think you actually just hit on something very important. Um, I think empowering yourself to the point where they can throw those types of things at you all day and they will roll off your back because you are secure in who you are and what you are in your beliefs is much more effective than trying to come up with a response to them because there's going to come a point, you know, if you can really, if you can really find your ground, stand your ground and, and be comfortable in your own skin, which is a lot, that's asking a lot, you know? Um, but if you can get there, those things are gonna roll right off your back. When you're secure in your spirituality, you're secure in your identity, those things become so irrelevant, you know? That's, that's, a, that's a really good point because it can also be a trigger and you can see that sometimes in the comments when you see that and you just see a litany of responses because it's a trigger, you feel the judgment. So that trigger might be a signal that this is a place where you need to do some, some work to stand, up, stand in your authenticity. Very, very good point. All right, I have a question for you. This one is, if homosexuality is woven into the Old Testament, should we consider how the Jewish people themselves viewed homosexuality at the time? Were they more accepting? Now, I was going to completely uh, say, I'm not going to touch this question, but if, and if, if you feel like you have an answer for this one, you go right ahead. Well, you're, I mean, it's, that's something we can't answer because we're talking about people, you know, how many years ago right thousands you know so I'm at thousands of years ago so I can't necessarily we can't speak for their um we there is no way that anyone any human being be they Hebrew scholars or not speak for what people were thinking or believing during that time yes now are there progressive um Jewish ideology, of course, there are progressive Jews, just like there are progressive Christians. 
there are progressive rabbis, just like there are, pro, you know, progressive pastors. And I don't think, you know, to say were they more open-minded or what? What was the verbiage exactly that was used? No, in that question? it was. Should we can should we consider if homosexuality is woven into the Old Testament? Should we consider? how the Jewish people themselves viewed homosexuality at the time. So yeah, that it, asking for our viewpoint is, is irrelevant. You're absolutely right. There's nothing that we can say, nor are either of us Jewish. So we can't speak on behalf of what this is, but there's an assumption here that homosexuality is woven. And that could come from the place where during the God is gay class, we were talking about Leviticus 18.22 and how that man shall not lie with man and how that has been mistranslated and taken out of context to really be talking about temple prostitution and that that, that was not something that God was ordaining for the Jewish people to do, the Israelites to do. But I'm not even sure that I can agree with homosexuality being woven through the Old, Old Testament because some scholars believe that the Bible is homophobic, like that this, this was what it is and, and you stand on that, but the fact that it's contextual and historical and irrelevant to where we are today. Because like I'm, I constantly say, we're no longer throwing babies in, in volcanoes yeah, anymore. Yeah, I, I would agree. It's, yeah. I think it's irrelevant, you know, yeah. what they thought at that point. Um, I always say, and this is an analogy I used to use all the time. Do you want to go to a doctor that you know that practices medicine the way they did during that time or you know or do you want to go to a doctor that practices medicine the way we do today you know how do you want to live your life that's so good <laughs> exactly <laughs> how do you want yeah. to live your life that that's very good all right moving on i'll take the next question how do we find good resources for correctly translating words such as daniel 1:9 so Daniel uh, 1 9 was a phrase that I used during my presentation. I'm sorry, a Bible verse that I used during um, our, my part of the presentation in the God is Gay Masterclass. And in that, there is a enough evidence that some scholars believe that Aspinaz, who was one of the uh, um, officers for King Nebuchadnezzar, had fallen in love with Daniel, one of the eunuchs. And um, so the, the first thing I would say is I wouldn't, I wouldn't say anything in the Bible is correct. So correctly translating something is beyond our control because there's not enough of the, of the ancient scripture compiled together to say that we can 100% know what exactly is being said or how things have been translated. We've added paragraphs and punctuations and verses Oh, we have no idea. You, you move a comma and, and a sentence can change. The, the infamous let's eat grandma versus let's eat <laughs> comma grandma, that kind of thing. But to, I'm going to just move past that and say, what are good resources? Well, I would go to biblehub.com and there you can see as many dip, different translations as you want. It defaults to the New International Version, but right underneath it, you'll see, I think I'm looking at 60 different translations for Daniel 1.9. And so you can see that, just looking through those translations, how it changes. And, and then you can actually add more. So I would use a resource like biblehub.com. That's something that I use all the time when I'm when I'm researching. So biblehub.com is where is the uh, is what I would use for that. And you know, I would be the first to say that the Asfanaz Daniel story, certainly there are people who are going to push back very hard to say, no, that's not what it was. I think there's enough there to say we don't know. And I think it's okay to say that, but, but when you are convinced that your homophobia, your religious beliefs that are entrenched in homophobia are confirmed by the Bible, then so be it. That's exactly what you're going to, that's the lens that you're going to look for. So there's no way that Daniel and Aspenaz would have had a, a romantic relationship. Um, all right, here's another one for you. You ready? Sure. All right, we're just about done here. What would you say to the argument that homosexuality is just part of the human imperfection and isn't part of our original purpose? And 
Um, that one's kind of deep. So let me know if, if that's um, something you'd like to just <laughs> forget I asked. <laughs> no, 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 no. That's, I, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a good question, but it also alludes, the way the question is phrased alludes to the fact that our original condition, is that what was said? Yeah, uh, uh, let's see, let me, let me just read it again. What, what would you say to the argument that homosexuality is just part of the human imperfection and isn't part of our original purpose? Well, what is our original purpose? There you go. <laughs> you know, what is our original purpose, number one? No, first of all, that question suggests that homosexuality is solely a human condition. It's not. There you That's go. one of the first things that we said in the beginning of the class. Homosexuality is found in over 1,500 living species on the planet. We are the only ones that exhibit homophobia. You know, so to ask a question like, you know, to say it's something that is, it's natural. It's part of our nature. It's part of our character. And who determines what is perfect as opposed to imperfect? Those are social constructs. Perfection is a social construct. That's not a spiritual thing. Mm -hmm. You know, so all of these, this concept of sin, this concept of um, perfection as opposed to imperfection, these are all social constructs that were created for a reason, whether it's a reason for control, whether it's a reason to ostracize, you know, or separate or to divide, to put people in um, classes. It's a very classist ideology. It's, it's like a caste system almost, right? Yes. Um, so it just, it's, it's the only thing that I think is that we need to worry about as human beings. Uh, you know, we don't need to worry about being perfect or imperfect. The only thing we need to know to base our actions on is is what I'm doing causing harm? Am I harming anyone? That's perfect. That's all you need to ask yourself. Whether is this a sin? Is it not a sin? You know, is it, forget about all that. Am I harming anyone? If you're harming someone, then you can call it a sin. Okay. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, then don't do it. My, and I just had this conversation last night on, a, on a, a show, an atheist show that I was on because they wanted to know my take on spirituality. My philosophy, my spiritual philosophy is do no harm. That's it. Do no harm. That is the rule that I live by. That's lovely. And I think those of you know, we have a pretty dedicated following that's, that are coming along with us. And we're so honored. We, we see you in the lives and we see you in the comments sections. And um, I love to announce new things and, and pounce it on people. But starting next month, Reverend Art and I will also be doing several joint lives. Um, and I'm very excited about that. I think that will be a very good service for people. But I think there's a, a theme that's coming that seems to come up from our work together and for, you know, the, our ministry at Numa Soul Center for Spiritual Transformation. And that is spirituality does not have to be complicated. The rules that sometimes show up, everyone's looking. And, and even if you look at some of these questions, people are still looking for the how to. Mm -hmm. And when we can let that go, it is as simple as do no harm. That's it. It is as simple as what, what work do I need to do here and stop worrying what's, what's out here. And I love the answer to this. And the only thing I would add here is that this original purpose has, you know, has a little bit of that original sin tinge to it. And knowing, knowing the energy that was available, that was, that was surrounded that class, how, loving and open and supportive and receiving everyone was the only other thing I would add is that this person more than likely is still filtering some beliefs through yeah. through that that evangelical hey, there you go <laughs> that, that evangelical trauma yes because I, the truth is what purpose do we have other than to companion one another 
you know, uh, through the life is hard enough as it is. Life is difficult. As good as we think we may have it, you know, life can be hard, harder for others, more, you know, more difficult for some than others. What is our only responsibility then to just not harm one? You know, you don't have to love everybody. You don't. And it's unrealistic to think that you will. You don't have to walk in the gay pride parade waving a banner. You don't have to. Just don't harm anybody. Mm. That's it. That's good. Well, and what you said about trauma, it, this is going to be our last question. And I'll start and I'd love to for you to answer as well. It says, being a Christian pastor's son uh, that has come out recently, what advice can you give for having so much oppressive traumatic background? And the oppressive that really it did the same thing to me. It really, it really got me on that. And of course, the first thing we always say is that if this trauma is inhibiting you from in, it, being fully capable of, of experiencing any part of your life or able to work or anything, of course, seek out a licensed therapist. If there is a spiritual counselor that is in your area, of course, there's, you know, we can, we can hopefully recommend them to some, some of our resources as well, but having someone who's experienced in spiritual counseling is something else that where we can, can help them. But the first step is recognizing that the oppression was traumatic. That's huge for people because some people, the first time they ever even realized that religious trauma was something was when we, we said it. It's amazing how many people have reached out to say, I had no idea this was a thing because they didn't, they were, they were believing that there was something in them that was broken, that they were still trying to take responsibility for the experience that they didn't fit the mold. So there was something broken with them when in reality, they have been traumatized. So that's the first step. Um, well, the first step would be licensed therapy. If you need it, the second therapy. Uh, is admitting it. The third is trying to find a spiritual counselor to help help you with some of this. But then also staying in these communities, because this is so new, you and I, we know we're going to be uh, creating workshops and classes that are coming up that are going to deal specifically with, with recovering from religious trauma. We're bringing in more people. The workshops are coming soon, too soon to announce right now, but we know what's coming, my friends. So please stay uh, here inside this community so that we can uh, help you as you start this journey of recovery. The only thing I would say, and this again takes me back to my own religious trauma, just because someone has gone to Bible college does not mean that they are a spiritual counselor. I've seen now they're changing that because they're getting called out on it so much that they're changing it to biblical counseling. So if you're still part of a spiritual community or a denominational or church experience and you feel like you have religious trauma, just because your pastor went to Bible college does not mean that they are capable of giving you any kind of sound advice. As a matter of fact, more than likely, their number one goal is to make sure that your body stays in the church pew. So I would encourage you, I don't do this very often. The closest thing I come to proselytizing is saying that if you trust what we are doing here, where we are empowering you to find your own path, that, that starts to heal what's broken inside you. We just encourage you to stay place where you, where you feel seen, safe, and respected. So that's what I have to say about that. How about you? Uh, I don't have much more to say other than, um, I think you covered everything other than, I, I can't stress the importance of finding the right type of spiritual counselor. You know, there are psychotherapists that are also spiritual counselors. There's not a lot of them, but there are. they are there and they are specially trained to deal with religious trauma. Um, a lot of therapists don't necessarily understand religious trauma, you know? And a lot of people that, like you said, uh, they're changing the name now, which I appreciate. Um, spiritual counseling is a specialized area. Yeah. And it's not going to come from the person who's standing in the pulpit. There you go. That's, that's, that is definitely, definitely the bottom line. And um, 
like I said, if you if you need help, please email us at info at numasoul.com. We do have some resources um, that where we can refer you to some people who are working online in spiritual counseling. I had a call this week with someone who has experience as being a licensed therapist, and she's in the middle of a of a crisis and she she's been going to her own therapist and she realized the disconnect now is really what's happening to her is the spiritual crisis and she's looking for someone who can help her with that and she's intuitive enough experienced enough to know that difference so i think as time goes on people will become more um, attuned and experienced and trained in spiritual counseling because it's such a unique field so all right, everyone, we have now concluded with all of the questions and we're going to actually be ending this uh, podcast on time. I tend to, I tend to go <laughs> over from time or two. My friends, thank you. This, our time together here is just so meaningful with you. And uh, we are right now recording this in June. So this is still Pride Month. And uh, we do have at the end of this month, June 30th, the hidden homosexual. Now I expect this to fill up very soon. And I know I am so excited about this class. I'm going to have my notebook out ready to learn. So please join us for that. Uh, you can find registration info at numasoul.com. And as always keep looking for more information as we keep moving along here. Okay, beloveds, I'm honored to be in this space with you. I know uh, I have received something and I pray you did too. And I have so enjoyed having Reverend Arda in this space. Please keep looking for her as we continue to uh, work on our things together. And now beloveds, go in peace, be at peace, go in love and may you be loved. Go and know that others are on this journey with you and you are not alone. You are seen and deeply and unconditionally loved just the way you are. Blessings on your week, and we will see you soon. Bye for now. Thanks for tuning in to another Unca episode of Spirituality Matters. To submit questions to Rev Carla, email us at spiritualitymatters at revcarla.com. Follow at Rev Carla on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and Pinterest for more spirituality teachings. Check out her blog posts at revcarla.com and sign up for email alerts while you're there so you don't miss a thing. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos. Bye for now.